Cab and Rockdale County. She has a, a younger sibling, Derek, who may join us uh, this afternoon as well, and a four year old daughter. Please join me in welcoming Alicia Wheeler. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Trey, for that introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming today. This is a little new to me, so I've only done this at conferences. So <laughs> please bear with me. Uh, I will try to make sure I don't go as fast as I normally do. But hi, I'm Alicia Wheeler. Uh, I am uh, Susie Wheeler's granddaughter. And I do have um, a sibling who, like, I said, like he said, may join us, who is also her grandson. Uh, for those of you who um, knew my family or are aware of my family, my father was Daniel Wheeler. Wheeler Jr., um, excuse me, um, he passed away February 15th, the day that I was supposed to first do this. So um, I was nervous about doing this, but I know he would want me to. He was so excited that I was going to come to Cartersville and speak about his mom. And he said, oh, you got to do that. And he was determined to come with me. And I was like, Dad, I don't think they're going to let us out of here. Uh, but um, I was determined to get this done. And so it's still fresh. So if y'all excuse me on the, the tears. Um, but they're good tears. You know, I have happy memories of Cartersville. So coming here always feels like home. Thank you. <laughs> coming here always feels like home. I have to stop myself from pulling up to 105 Fight Street and pulling in my grandma's yard. <laughs> Because I'm like, they don't live there anymore, and I'm gonna, I am gonna—I don't want to get in trouble. But um, it just feels like home. And so uh, thank you all for coming today, like I said, and thank you for welcoming me back home. Um, I know my grandmother would be really excited as well, and she would just be clapping her hands and doing her la-la-las that she used to do whenever she was excited. <laughs> so um, I uh, wanted to share this. I decided to do a little research on my grandmother based on some information that I learned about when I was in school. And so um, after I did my research and I thought about speaking on her today, instead of thinking of the title, A Life Well Lived, I really thought Well Loved fit her more. Um, because as I did research, everything came back to community for my grandmother. And that was so important to her and so powerful. And so that's why I titled it A Life Well Loved. And so, like I said, thank you all for coming. And I'm going to go right into it. Excuse me, let's try to make sure I use this correctly. Okay, a little bit of background history before I begin. In teacher education, so I've been teaching now, this is my uh, 22nd or 20th year as an educator. Um, we are taught as pre-service teachers 
Um, and I don't know, are there any educators in this room right now, or former educators? Okay, so you, okay, so you may recognize some of the pictures, right? We are usually taught about, as my professors described, the dead white men of education, okay? And so we would learn about Lev Vygotsky, Jean Piaget, Eric Erickson, and that's how my professors would describe it. We never learned about the women in education, period, and especially not the women of color. And so that is why I ended up kind of going into a little bit more research on uh, Dr. Wheeler, my grandmother. I forgot I had this. Um, and so I did some research on some of the women who did work in education. And this all came from a push in my classes at UAB, uh, University of Alabama at Birmingham is where I got my doctorate. And uh, my professors encouraged us to start researching some of the women in co of color who were pioneers in education as well. And I attended a book talk um, on a book called Schoolhouse Activists about the work of African American men and women during the civil rights era who fought for justice kind of covertly under, you know. And so doing that, I heard more and more about Rosenwald schools. I heard the name come up and I heard Jean's supervisor come up. And I went back to class and I told my professor, I know a little bit about Rosenwald schools. I know my grandmama went to one and I know she was a gene supervisor. And she said, oh, you have, to, you have to research your grandmother. And I was like, I can't write a dissertation on a person. But she was like, no, because who else is gonna tell her story? And she said, you have the connections. You can tell her story and keep her story alive and give her the, the just attention that she deserves for the work that she did in her community. So that's kind of where this research began. I knew my grandmother as grandmama. Um, I knew she was very, very connected to Noble Hill. I knew that she was a gene supervisor. I knew she was an educator. She was beyond excited when I became a teacher. But I didn't know much more than that. And so that's where this research kind of began. Uh, just a little bit of background there. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> okay, so a little background about Rosenwald schools as well. Uh, they began with the, it was the brainchild of Booker T. Washington and Julius Rosenwald. Uh, they worked together. Booker T. Washington was trying to get more community schools for his area, and he approached Julius Rosenwald to get him to uh, invest and offer money up. And so um, they began building these Rosenwald schools in the state of Alabama first, and then it moved all through the South. Um, Anna T. Jeans is the lady on this side. She is one of the uh, philanthropists that helped with Rosenwald Schools. The teachers that were hired to run Rosenwald Schools and be over Negro education, as they called it, uh, were called Jeans Supervisors. And they were paid for by a fund uh, from this uh, Quaker woman who was a philanthropist. And so that's kind of how this all began. Rosenwald was known to not want the attention. He didn't want them to be called Rosenwald Schools. But that's what they, were, they became known as. And another thing that I learned was that, yes, he gave money, but the families and communities raised more money than what was given to them. And that was something I didn't know as well. Um, they, were, they gave money, they gave time, they gave labor to build these schools for their children and their community. And so a little bit of family history, I tried to pull out my favorite pictures of my grandmama. Um, <laughs> this was our uh, last family picture um, uh, right after her 90th birthday party. I don't know if any of you all were in the room, but we surprised her with the 90th birthday party. And she was so excited about that party, and we took that picture together. And uh, she passed away later that year. But a little family history about her. So uh, Susie Wheeler is from, of course, this area. She was born right here in, um, in our lo the local county, she, uh, Cass County. Um, she had one son, Daniel Wheeler Jr. And uh, this is my mom, Clovia Wheeler. She couldn't be here with us because she recently had surgery, but she did send her love. And uh, then, of course, uh, the two children. And uh, Susie was born, like I said, to um, Percy and Cora uh, Weems. She was one of three children initially. She had a sister named Sarah and a brother named Thomas. And she was known to be a rambunctious child. I uh, read through her. This is her own biography, autobiography that she wrote. And I loved reading about uh, the fact that she used to, she snuck a cigarette one time into school and tried to so smoke it with her friends. And I was like, what, grandmama? Uh, because it didn't seem 
to match the grandmama that I knew, but it sounds like she was a tomboy and a little bit rambunctious. And so I feel like that's why, you know, she's very spirited, and I think that's why uh, I vibed with her as much as I did. But she attended Noble Hill, and I think I have the first picture in it. Um, yeah, so she was in the first class for Noble Hill School here in the county. And uh, she, this, this came from Noble Hill Wheeler Memorial Center. Uh, she is somewhere in that picture, but was really, really eager to learn in school and loved her first teachers. And that is what began her, started her journey as an educator. And so uh, I love this picture. I love seeing how it looked before and how it looks now and the way they restored it. So I always try to include this picture in every single uh, presentation that I do. So, as she went through Noble Hill, she went to other schools. Now, I tried to make sure I remembered all of them. She started at Noble Hill School, and then she went to Cabin Creek. And Valerie, if, you, if I missed something, please fill me in. Because <laughs> I was like... Um, then she went to Fort Valley, and then Atlanta University, which is now Clark Atlanta. She went to University of Georgia, and then Atlanta University again. So this was her work through to become an educator. Um, she did very well at Noble Hill and at Cabin Creek and became the valedictorian of her class and decided she wanted to become a teacher because she was so, um, um, I guess just invested and she loved her first grade teacher. And so she attended Fort Valley and became a member of Delta Sigma Theta as well, which she loved with all of her heart. I made sure not to wear my pink and green skirt today <laughs> out of respect for my grandmother. I had it picked out and I was like, no, I'm gonna put that back. So I made sure not to do that because uh, she was not happy when I pledged AKA at all. Um, that's what Faye and I were just talking about. But uh, she uh, attended Fort Valley and got her degree there. And as she worked to become a teacher, well, first of all, back then you did not need a college degree to become a teacher, which I also didn't know. But she did get encouraged to go ahead and get that degree because she, was, she knew how to do the work. And so she attends um, Atlanta U University out of a push from uh, Dr. Robert Cousins, I believe it was, who was the head of Negro education at the time, and he wanted her to take classes to become a genes supervisor. And so he encouraged her to take these classes. And so she attends Atlanta University, she gets that information, she learns from those classes, and the one thing that she pushed was, yes, I'll become a genes supervisor, but I want to be in Bartow County or near Bartow County. That was a major part of the agreement for her. If I do it, I want to be close to home. And so she worked to get that. I, I, um, trying to remember all my different degrees that she had. Um, I don't think it was called a master's at the time. It was a fifth year degree, I believe. She earned that as well. Uh, and then she went to the University of Georgia for, I believe, a specialist maybe. And then she got her doctorate in 1978 at Atlanta University, which is now Clark Atlanta University. So this was her walk into her path as a uh, educator, as a career educator. So a little background, I didn't put a heading there, but I wanted to make sure I talked about a little bit about her family at the time. She decided to work on her degrees. This is a picture of my dad and my grandfather and my grandmother. Um, and it's so ironic because my brother is the spitting image of my dad. And he didn't used to like to be told that, but now he sees it. Um, so if, if you get to see him today, you'll see it. He looks just like Danny. Uh, but. In her time working on her degrees, she got married to Daniel Wheeler Sr., who had been a family friend that she had known from church. Um, she had joined New Hope Missionary Baptist Church as a young child. And uh, he went away to the war. And so while he was away, that's when she worked on her degrees. That's when she got a lot of her education done, was while he was away. And then they had one son, Danny, uh, Daniel Wheeler Jr., who was my father. And so just a little bit of background there. Um, she did a lot of, as Grandmama, uh, sorry, I need to call her Dr. Wheeler, as she traveled and got her education, she took Danny with her to different universities. And so this is what really encouraged her to do different things here because she saw different things around when she traveled to Kentucky, to Spelman, and that kind of thing. So a little background there. Okay, so a little bit more about Jean Supervisors. This was another book I found. Um, I didn't even know it existed. I actually was looking up my grandfather's name, and this book popped up. It's called Torches of Light. Um, Dr. Wheeler and several other women from this area were interviewed by this author, Anne Shearhart, I believe is her name, and I did contact her uh, to thank her for this work. She interviewed all of them, and I think it might have been 
a few years before she um, uh, passed away, three, four years before gra my grandmother passed away. But I loved this quote, and I used it in my um, dissertation as well as in my defense, which was that as Jean's supervisors, uh, Narby Jordan Harris, Susie Williams Wheeler, had worked with black communities in addition to schools. They not only taught academic subjects, but also informed residents of changes occurring around them. And so I loved hearing the stories about uh, Dr. Wheeler, about the fact that she could go to these meetings uh, that were meant for only white people, and they would still let her sit in there and take her notes and bring her notes back to her community. Um, to me, as an educator now, it is much more than just the book information. Um, that is one of the things that I'm very serious about with my students now as an educator at the college level, but also when I had elementary age students, was I teach more than just the academics. And I do think that came from her, that building of community, getting to know their families, right? Being able to see them and know who they were. And so I thought that was a powerful um, quote, and they were among the last teachers to have taught uh, during uh, segregation. Um, so she became a gene supervisor and then an area gene supervisor where she had multiple districts under her uh, watch. And, oh, hey, go back a little bit before I get to that. Uh, her work was in curriculum development. She also secured funds for these schools. She worked to, of course, support um, teachers if there was a behavior problem. And from what I read in here, it sounded like she had a very loud and boisterous voice and could gather the attention of the children if they were cutting up. And so again, <laughs> uh, that uh, spoke to me as well. Um, I, I know I was known as a bit of a rougher teacher around the edges, you know, with my behavior, uh, classroom management as well. And so I loved hearing that story from her in her book. She also talked about the fact that a lot of times she had to, she hand wrote her notes for her teachers. I have books and books of the, she kept them all, uh, where she hand wrote notes and faculty meetings. Uh, there's even one where she wrote a note explaining that she would be off for a while and that was right around when my father was born and that she was going to be taking three or four months off. And so she kept records, she kept up with the changes, she talked about the different things she saw being implemented in different counties as she was area gene supervisor. So if she saw something great happening in one county, she encouraged another county to pick up those same things and bring, and bring that to light. Some of the other things that she did while she was a gene supervisor and an area gene supervisor, she had, um, was able to see that there was a need for a daycare or child care center for African American children here in Cartersville. And so she started one. Uh, she started the first community center for children here. Uh, it was in someone's home at first from what I read, and then it moved into a location. She also started the first public library for African Americans here. I believe it was called the Faith Cabin Library. Um, and so she did all of these things as she experienced things with her son. I know for sure she said that she um, took um, my dad to different places and didn't have care for him, but she saw him also in different child development centers, and she wanted to bring that here. And so those were a few of the things that she started here in Cartersville as well. In addition to working as an area gene supervisor, um, her husband, uh, Daniel Wheeler um, Sr., did some of his own uh, business ventures. I don't know if any of you remember the Wheeler, Wheeler Memor Morris Service Center. I believe that was the full title of it. Uh, but he had a barber shop there. And I have very vivid memories and a laundromat. I remember going there and I remember him always having the Christmas um, decorations across the top of the building. And uh, so it's really, that's one of the things that I always felt was important to see. This is a picture of uh, uh, Dr. Wheeler, her husband, Daniel Wheeler Sr., my dad, D Daniel Wheeler Jr., me doing this move, and my, and my younger brother in front of the center. And so uh, that's just a little bit about us. But we, um, we loved coming to visit. Like I said, we were here. Uh, my grandmother used to say she loved to see us come and she loved to see us leave too. <laughs> because we, um, we usually would spend some summers here. She would take us to, Del I think it was Dellinger Park. <laughs> Park, she would take us there, and there was also a little park right near her house. And so these are just some memories that I had of her. Uh, another thing that uh, my grandfather, Daniel Wheeler Sr., accomplished was he um, had streets named after our family. Alicia Circle that's named after me. I believe my brother, there was one called Derek Lane, and then I don't know what is the, I forget the name of the neighborhood. But he did have that as well. 
So uh, like I said, he cut hair and he loved doing that as well. So as she kind of came to the end of her career as an educator, Dr. Wheeler joined uh, President Jimmy Carter's Friendship Force. And this was something that she was very proud of. Um, she and her husband, Daniel Wheeler Sr., would travel all around the world and work with others um, to build connections and relationships with people from other places. Um, I remember her coming back from each trip and putting a star on a globe with my brother and I to show us where they had traveled that time. And she would talk to us about the customs, and she would talk to us about building relationships with people who weren't just like us. And so I still have that, uh, I actually took that globe, I made sure to keep it. It's been in my classroom ever since I started teaching, and it's still in my office today. Uh, it's very important to me. I don't have the stick, the, the stars don't stick anymore. <laughs> but the globe itself just is powerful to me. Uh, but they did this for years, and that was one of the things that she felt was so important as she learned. One thing I also noticed was that she was constantly learning. Even when she finished her PhD or her EDD, she continued to learn. And that, so she was truly a lifelong learner. And so that was something that I felt was important, an important lesson for myself as well as my brother. So she joined that. And then she also noticed that the Noble Hill School was in disrepair. And so um, these are some pictures that I found from some newspaper clippings. Again, these were ones that she kept. And, um, you know, she, I, I do, re, I don't, I remember visiting, <laughs> I do remember visiting, I'll use my teacher voice, Noble Hill, this is a picture of my brother and I with my grandmother and Thelise Robinson, who is uh, Fax Robinson's uh, daughter as well. And I do remember visiting Noble Hill, but I don't remember being overly interested in it at the time. <laughs> But I remember it being dirty and there being a lot of wood everywhere and her telling us to be safe. Uh, and so this is where it all started. Um, she started working with people to work on um, restoring Noble Hill. So she worked with Justice Benham and a few other people in the area and stakeholders in the community to start restoring this, uh, this school. And I'm sorry, I missed one part. After Area Jean's supervisor, she decided to work as a the curriculum director. Or she was hired as curriculum director for Bartow County Schools. This was right after um, integration. And so I wanted to make sure I introduced the part, share that part as well. Okay, so this is where the hard work begins. She begins procuring funds to help restore Noble Hill. And she worked diligently to do that. She had money coming in from multiple companies in the area, and they gave checks, and multiple people did. And I see, um, like I said, I know I see a few familiar faces in the pictures, but she worked to gather funds to be able to restore this. She wanted to make sure that that history was saved, the history that started her educational career. And so she begins working to uh, gather that money. This was in the 80s, late 80s. And they worked to uh, restore Noble Hill Wheeler Memorial Center into what it is today, which is a, a museum with African American history and um, heritage. One thing that I love about Noble Hill is that there are so many pieces of it that were the same from before. And so everything that I read about, the pot-bellied stove, the kinds of windows, everything is still there, and that's powerful to me. Um, I was sharing with uh, Trey that um, I met a, um, a professor from, I think it's Wayne something uh, University in New Jersey, and she emailed me last week and said, hey, I wanted to let you know I donated to Noble Hill, and I'm going to visit Cartersville this summer because I want to see it in person. And so I think it's powerful that the work that these people did here in Cartersville has kept going for all these years, and I know that has to do with all of the work that's put in for Noble Hill now, including the board and our uh, amazing cur curator, Valerie Coleman. But I think it's amazing that people are still donating. Um, so this is how Noble Hill looks now. Of course, you all know that because y'all are here. Uh, but they work to restore that as well. And so um, that is it. Um, I wanted to make sure I opened it up for questions. I hope I can answer a few. I was trying myself my best not to get a little emotional there. but. Um, Thank you. Thank you for understanding. But I do want to open the floor for questions, and I hope I can answer them. If not, I hope my cousin Valerie will be able to help me. Uh, but uh, any questions? Reverend Young, thank you for coming to Young Harris. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Maybe I'm 
Okay, so Anna T. Jeans was the uh, Quaker woman who procured the funds. Yes, and so it was named after her. I don't. I'm sure she was probably like Rosenwald, where she didn't want it to be named after her, but that was the name of it. I think the initial name of it, and again, y'all excuse me, I, my dissertation was a while, was the Negro R Rural Fund, I think was the initial name, but it became known as the Jeans Fund. Yeah, so Jeans Teachers. And so they were considered the black superintendents of the black schools during segregation. Yes. Gavin, Gavin, please. So... I don't remember. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I only got to remember. That was her high school, I believe. And it was it a boarding? I believe it was a boarding school that she had to travel to. Um, and she said, I remember her vividly telling me she didn't like to have to travel because when she got back, she didn't want to have to walk home. And she had further to go than everybody else. Uh, but that was her high school. So, Griffin, thank you. Because <laughs> I only got to remember. I think you said she graduated from Oh, yes, I'm sorry about that. So she was born 19, oh gosh, y'all, I'm sorry, 14, was it 17? 1917, okay, born 1917. So she went to Noble Hill as a six-year-old in 1924 when it opened. And then she was there through elementary school. My apologies on that, yes. So she went through elementary school before high school for that, yes. Did she share her autobiography about her dissertation? Yes, so I have a copy of her dissertation. Um, it's a lot. I did read through it. Um, it is. It is a lot. I actually shared a good bit of it in my um, my uh, defense as well. And I got the copy from uh, my cousin Joy Hill uh, when she w because when I started this research, Joy was still the curator of the museum at the time. And so I, I messaged her and said, um, "Hey, cuz, I think I'm going to research Grandmama for my dissertation." And she was like, "Oh, I got a bunch of stuff. You got to come here and visit me." So I drove over one day. And she just took me through all of Noble Hill because, again, I hadn't been back for years. And so she gathered it. So I do have a copy of it. Uh, her dissertation was all about the integration of the schools in Bartow County. And it was more of a longitudinal study. Um, from what I read um, from some of her writings, it sounds like she hadn't planned on getting her doctorate, but she had already done the work to write the dissertation. And so someone encouraged her, just turn this into a dissertation and get your degree. And I think by the time she finished her dissertation, she was at the end of her career as an educator. I believe she retired two years later, maybe, and started doing her other things. Is it? Okay. Yes. Oh man, so many things from Grandmama. Um, yes, uh, when I when I worked to get my master's degree, I remember her saying, "Well, I mean, nobody said it was going to be easy, so you just have to do it because that's why everyone doesn't have it." And she, you know, Grandmama was tough. Like she was tough, um, but she was like, because I was working full time at the time, and I was like, I don't know how people do this. You know, this is hard. And she was like, No one said it was going to be easy, but you're young. So she would just tell me, even during the tough times get through it. She always, um, she always said lean on your family. Uh, she was very big on lean on me, you know, lean on us. But she would say, I like the way, I just remember maybe the, a week or two before she passed, I was in her hospital room. And I was trying to figure out how to up, do the tray up and down or something. And she said, I like the way you concentrated to figure that out. And that's what I've been trying to teach you. And she always said that growing up, too. So I remember her, and she would do her finger like that. And so, um, yeah, y'all remember, like, that's, I like the way you kind And so that's one thing that she pushed my brother and I to do. If we went to church with her, especially when she came to Birmingham, you best believe we were going to be quizzed on it the whole drive home. What did you learn? What did the pastor say? Why were you not paying attention on this part? Like it was, she was very much like, pay attention and be on all the time. Um, so I know that um, you know, she pushed us to, to be our best, and she just encouraged us. But she was very much like, get your work done. Um, she wanted to see my grades when she came to town. She wanted to uh, visit. And she told me um, when I started teaching here, because I moved here right after college, and she said, now you know you have to treat all children the same, no matter whether they're black or white. 
I said, yes, prayer mama. She said, okay, I'm just making sure you know. And I said, yes, ma'am. And so she was very much just, this is how we do it. And so I think that teaching um, voice that she used always bled over into real life. But um, that was the main thing, just, you know, concentrate and get it done and move forward. Yeah. Okay, yes. Yes. She was in that book. So that book, I found it online on Amazon maybe a week or two before I had to submit my dissertation. So my dissertation chairperson said, Alicia, you do not have time to read that whole book. Pick out two things that your grandmother said from the book and put it in here. We don't have time. If you're trying to graduate, because I was, my goal was to graduate while my father was still here. Um, I, I want, and he wanted me to finish. He was very... Um, adamant about that and so I didn't have time to read the whole book is what I was getting at I uh for those of you that don't know I adopted my daughter at birth and uh, I was working on my doctorate at the time and I remember telling my father I'm gonna adopt a baby dad she's already here and she needs a family and he said absolutely not absolutely not you about done with your doctorate no ma'am <laughs> and I was like and I said well and I, I think I said I wasn't asking for your permission I was asking for your support and he was like <laughs> but I promised him I was going to finish that degree and so uh, I made sure to do it so that being said I didn't read the whole thing but the book has highlights maybe six or eight women from Georgia who worked with children uh, in their communities during segregation and carried the torch forward from the educators before them like Nanny Helen Burroughs um, Oh, there are so many that uh, a lot of people just don't know about. Anna Julia Cooper, these women of color who were educators and didn't get their uh, due attention. Um, so that book, um, like I said, I found it on Amazon, and I did email the uh, author who worked here, and she came here and went to the houses of these women, the ones who were still living, and interviewed them. And so, and I think it was 2000, let's see, my grandmother died in 2007. I think, I think that's right. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Um, I think she interviewed them in maybe 2004, 2003. So yes, that book is available on Amazon. It is called Torches of Light. I don't know a lot of specific, but I know that it tells the story of how um, there was, there was one part, I didn't share this part. She talks about the work they did under the table to help with integration and with civil rights. And I do remember sharing, um, this was a story my grandmother told me about a cross burning in her yard. And um, how, and my dad remembered the story. He, I interviewed him and he talked to me about it. But he said he, he knew she had to be up to something other than just being a super, gene supervisor if there was a cross burning in the yard, you know. And he said he just kept staring at it. I think my grandfather was at work that day and um, I tried to get more details. Of, you remember that, Ms. Liz? Okay. And so dad said he just kept staring at it. His mom was telling him to get back. But that being said, he was like she had to be involved in more civil rights. I know she was a member of NAACP, AAUW, several other groups that worked together. Um, but there's a lot more of information about that in the book. Um, that It's a great book. Yes. Yeah, is she? Okay, it's she. Love it. Yes. I was amazed that she emailed me back. Okay. It's huge. Yes, and I knew I knew names like Narvi J. Harris. I knew there was an elementary school named after her because I worked here for years, but I had never heard of Dr. Shaw. But she did email back. Um, she was eager to read it. I know she doesn't live here in Georgia anymore. I think she moved. Um, but she was like, no, these stories need to be told. So she was glad I was writing it. So that's, empower that's powerful. Yes, yes Dr. Ann Shearheart. Let me, let me go back to the title. To Torches of, okay, I'm sorry. Torches of Light, Georgia Teachers and the Coming of the Modern South. Ann Short Shearheart, or Shearheart. And, um, yeah, it, it's got, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great book. I read some parts of it to my father um, in, the, in the last few months. Uh, he had lost most of his eyesight, so he couldn't see it. Uh, so I read sections of it to him, and he really loved that. And he kept saying, I want to read this book. I want to read this whole book. And I said, I do too. Uh, but I haven't had a chance to just yet. But um, 
Yeah, I just, I, I literally was just looking at my grandfather's name and that, that book popped up on Amazon. <laughs> so if you have a chance, you may want to, you know, check that out. Yes. <laughs> yes, she did. <laughs> that's so true and that that is something that I, I hope to carry forward for myself as well as my daughter uh, going to events in the community getting to know the community the members of the community because I think that's a that's a vital part that was the core of her life was staying home and being in with her community so I agree I absolutely agree Thank you. I really appreciate it. I, um, I, I, I definitely, um, researching her, was, was pr I was pretty stoic on it. And then I, I um, definitely got emotional during the defense because uh, maybe the day before my grandmother died, she had had a stroke. And so she was in a facility and we were visiting her. And I said, I'm never going to let people forget you, Grandmama. And she couldn't answer, but her she went like this. And so I felt like I, I kept that promise to her by sharing. Uh, and so I just write about it. Um, I have an article hopefully coming out. I had trouble writing it because uh, it was due right after my father passed. And um, so I couldn't finish it, but my professors helped me through. Uh, it should be an article on Grandmama in a major early childhood education journal. Um, it is the NAEYC journal, The Young Child. And it's a column called Our Proud Heritage. And the editors were like, you need to put her in that. Um, if we're writing about pioneers in education, she should be in that. So I hope that that will be published. I feel like there's going to be a lot of editing that I have to do. Uh, but it should be published later, um, later this year. Um, but I think her story deserves to be told, as do all of the women who went before those of us who are women of color and who are teachers now. Someone had to pave that way. You know, and so to hear those stories and to hear the push behind get this education. I know my father came to some of my fifth grade classrooms and talked about integrating Cartersville High School and how he was the only black student to show up and how his mom still made him do it. And I was like, well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's grandmama. Um, she's going to make you do it. And so um, hearing him share that with those fifth grade students, and they were like, well, were you scared? What, you know, and the fact that it was so recent, I think, was powerful because this is just my dad. Like, that's how recent this thing happened, this, this, this has happened, this change. Um, so, um, but yeah, thank you for that. I truly appreciate it. And I'm, I'm hoping that, I know I can just imagine how excited she is to hear her story being told. So um, I'm going to keep doing it. And I owe you a lot of materials that Joy gave me. <laughs> Valerie, I promise I'm going to bring them back. <laughs> I promise. I know they're not mine. I need, I need to turn them right back in. Yes. <laughs> That was hard finding out about her. So there was a book going around uh, by Andrew Filer that I just saw someone had. But so yes, that book was powerful. And it told the story of the Rosenwald schools. Over, over 5,000 were built initially and only maybe 500 stand now. So that's huge. But Anna T. Jeans, I found her in the books. Like there was another book called uh, by Stephanie Deutsch. Dutch called You Need a Schoolhouse. I think that was the title. And um, there was information about Anna T. Jeans in there, but there was never like an article or a book that I could find just about her. Like even trying to hunt down that picture was difficult. I found it in the Library of Congress, I think. 
Not that I saw. Um, and I, I still had trouble understanding where it started because it sounded like she was from, I think, Pennsylvania. So I don't understand how the connection came down to... So a Quaker, yeah, that's right. Yes, yes. My daughter was born in Pennsylvania, and I remember driving to pick her up, and I was on the phone with my mom, and I saw a horse-drawn carriage going across the freeway, and I was like, oh, it's a horse. My mom was like, that's Quaker. You know, you, you know, you're in Quaker country. So that's right, Pennsylvania. But yeah, I don't understand how that ended up down south or how that worked, but I do know her fund went to support uh, African, the salaries of African-American teachers, teachers in poorer communities. And so I guess somehow that connected with Rosenwald schools and it became the gene supervisors. But they did have to take special leadership classes to do that. So yeah. Oh, do you? Okay. Maybe that's how it yeah, trickled down south. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, she was petite but powerful. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Right. Yes. That's a great question. Yes, my um so my great grandmother, her mother Cora, was a laundress, but she encouraged her children to learn. So she worked on a farm. Her father was a tenant farmer and he passed away when she was very young, um, I think six or seven years old. And so her mother remarried a man who um I found their records. What was it? Uh, I found their census records. Um, most of them could not read. And they were um, listed as uh, mulatto, which I know now is a derogatory term, but that's what they were listed at on the census in the like 70, early 20s, I think it was. 19, I don't remember. But um, her stepfather, Oscar Canty, did, could read and was a poet and he encouraged her to read. And so that is how she kind of got into education and she was good at it. I mean, I think she went to school but she was so encouraged by that first grade teacher. So it was that teacher, it was her mom and her stepfather that encouraged her to keep going forward. And so she um, just felt like if I could do this, well maybe I can do this next step. Well maybe I can do this next step. And so that's kind of how she led into it. And you're right, I mean that is something I encourage with my daughter. Um, she has been on many different college campuses already because I was dragging her with me. You know, I'm a single mom. You got to come over here with me so I can finish this. And so she is seeing it as well. Uh, she's four. Like I said, she'll be going to kindergarten this year. Uh, she's a handful. She's a handful. But what's wild, too, I don't know if I shared this. Um, my uh, daughter's birthday is the same exact day 11 years later that my grandmother passed away. And we see similarities. My brother. This is Derek Weaver. This is the other uh, grand. Sorry, Derek. <laughs> Derek's like, what? Sorry. <laughs> uh, but my daughter was born uh, 11 years to the day that my grandmother passed away, and she has her similarities. She's she's very abrupt, and she does my grandmother's la la. la. Like my grandmother used to like make, make little sing songs all the time. La 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 la. That's my daughter. Um, so I do see that generational thing as well. So thank you for that question. I think Grandmama would be very proud that we are continuing our education, both my brother and I. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, you can go. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I, I uh, have a question related to uh, her role in Rosenwald School. Yes. Uh, I know that you have Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm looking for information that would 
share the influence of the, the church on her, which that teacher likely was a member of. Yes. Uh, in, you know, to connect the, the positive influence that the church has had in the community. Yes. As telling the people's story, not the building's story. Mm -hmm. Anything you could offer sure. in that Sure, yes. And I do remember visiting the church many times as a child as well. Um, I know she wrote about a lot about her time in the church and her work. She was a deaconess. Her husband was a deacon. Um, I don't know about the connection between that. I do know that the church in general was always very powerful with civil rights. I know that that is where a lot of civil rights move forward. Um, but there is a lot of information about New Hope that she wrote in her autobiography, and I'll be happy to share that with you. Uh, yeah, she um, she loved her church, and she was active, I mean, right up until the end. So um, I, I think that it's amazing that it's 150 years, too, but um, I would be happy to share that with you as well. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay, too. yes. Oh, okay. About my dad? Yes, absolutely. So uh, my dad and my mom met at Morris Brown College. Uh, she was a wheeler before she met my father. And so that's one of our little funny family. People thought they were related. That's how they met. Um, they were both dating other people. And I think they started doing some genealogy study, and then they ended up dating. Uh, so they're not related. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but she does go by Clovia Wheeler Wheeler, which always cracks people up. It's just... Yes, it's just the wildest thing. But uh, dad and mom met at Morris Brown College. Uh, when they graduated, they moved back to my mom's hometown, which is Birmingham, Alabama. And they both worked for Bell South. At the time, it was South Central Bell. Um, they, uh, and it changed over to Bell South and a few other things. Um, dad and mom, Derek, anything I missed to fill me in. Dad and mom ended up opening a Baskin Robbins. So he became an entrepreneur like his father. He was encouraged to do that by his dad. And so they opened that... Um, 1992, around that time, 93, uh, had a Baskin Robbins for several years, and they did very well with that. Um, Dad went on to work for several other computer, he was a computer programmer, both of them are or were. Um, Dad went on to, um, after he retired, he subbed in schools, which was really funny to me because he was like powerful like my grandmother, so that was hilarious. I would hear him fuss, and I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, he has that same gene. Uh, but he retired. And um, just, you know, spent time. So, of course, you know, he had both my brother and I. Um, he has two grandchildren. My daughter, Ella, is four, Ella Grace. And my niece, Giselle, Elizabeth, is six. Is Giselle six now? She's six. And uh, they love their papa. So he was named Papa, and um, he always loved his papa shirts. Uh, but he was, um, one thing I can share is that he was on dialysis for probably two or three years near the end of his life. And when he went on hospice and I went by the dialysis clinic because those people were like family. They took great care of my father. And it was so powerful for them to share their stories about him and how he never complained and how he fought and he fought. And so that was powerful for me hearing those stories even near the end of his life. One of them came to the visitation. Like so um, I think he lived a very powerful life as well. Um, and he, um, like I said, he was just so proud of his community. He wanted to come back and visit Noble Hill so badly these last few years and just physically wasn't able to. Um, but uh, overall, he had a, I mean, a, a amazing life, and he provided that for my brother and I as well. We both say we were blessed. Like, we, we went on family trips. He was at every one of Derek's football games, every single one. Went middle school through high school, right, D? And college. He played through college all four years. So very involved parent and grandparent. When I lived here in Georgia, this was one of my favorite stories. Dad would come over. Man, I can't look at you because make going to make me cry. Uh, Dad would drive over from Alabama to edge my grass up. <laughs> because I didn't know how to. I could cut it, but I didn't know how to edge it. He was like, now, Alicia, I'm not going to keep driving across the state line. I'm like, I don't want to pay anybody, Dad. I don't have any money. I'm a teacher. And so he was, he was just, he was a great, uh, amazing man and a great father. Yeah. So that's that. Yeah. So, Valerie, you want to take this? Do y'all have? Did I give you a copy? 
It's, do y'all have a copy? Okay. Okay. Maybe we could do a checkout thing there. This was, she just, I remember her writing this um, and giving us all copies. And I was like, Grandma, you don't wrote it. I don't want to read the whole book. Um, back then, of course. But um, I know she, I don't think she ever published it or anything. She just had it printed. I mean, you can see it's like, I mean, I think she typed it up, but she included all of her achievements and everything. She's got pictures from all of her trips. And she told her story from the beginning to the end, her New Hope story, her family story. So I believe there may be a copy at Noble Hill that maybe we could do as checkout. Yes, John. Yes. That would be awesome. Yes, we have multiple copies that she kept in her boxes of things at her house <laughs> that we went through. So we can make sure we, we get a copy. So yeah, we, we, she had a lot of stuff. She had a lot of stuff. Yes. Okay, thank y'all so much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Absolutely. I had the, the, the privilege of meeting you, Grandma, and a couple of occasions. I'm so glad your professor encouraged you to, to write her story. Like you said, you wanted to read stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I do want my friend and colleague, Valerie, to say a few words. to be able to uh, tell the story as well about the healer, because I'm getting a lot of lectures now too, so we're going to do this together. And um, just to let you know, our uh, photo from A Better Life uh, uh, for their children, uh, Andrew Filers, the picture is in Budapest now. Oh my it's in gosh. the house of Lucy. That's so awesome. Um, so we've been to Berlin, Paris, Tel Aviv, so it's around the around world. The world. So. Everybody's going to know about Dr. Williams' latest work, right. Noble Hill Ladies. And we you. are hosting the AKAs this week, so oh. I got to have it. <laughs> oh, Grandmama's going to be here. Ooh. She's going to be lit. Yes, I yeah. I have to with her to make sure it's Yes, okay. yes. <laughs> It'll be okay. It'll be okay. <laughs> we love you so much. Oh, thank you so much. And we're going to celebrate you. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. It's a great book. Well, thank you again for being here. Thank, thank you. Come back and see us again. And uh, enjoy the afternoon.